Keller. And you're very welcome along to the Saturday panel. Uh, it is Johnny Ward standing in here for whoever was probably supposed to be doing this. I think forecast that uh, the Christmas party was on and it'd be better off give the job to someone fresh and get me more into rugby and something like that. Um, but it's very easy to actually name the panel because we have Jenny Murphy, Johnny Murphy and the ever recognisable big Mal, Malcolm O'Kelly. How are you guys? Great. Thanks for having us. Uh, yeah, we're going to... I actually, I want to talk horses. <laughs> Screw the rugby. Because you actually have a big interest, Johnny. Yeah, I do. Yeah, we have um, a couple of syndicates down in Joseph O'Brien's. So, um, who are you involved with? Uh, it's two. One is called the Wait For Us Syndicate. We've got uh, myself. We've got a filly between myself, Conor Murray, Keith Earls, Andrew Conway, Damien Varley, and then Mr. X, because his partner doesn't know about it yet. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the Mr. X case. The Mr. X case. And then uh, we have uh, another one called the Rugby and Racing Syndicate. The lads are involved with that, and that's a big syndicate. So we have, that syndicate has six horses at the moment, six or seven horses at the moment. So we lease two or three and then we own uh, three or four at the moment so up and down numbers but generally kind of around six or seven all going well which is plenty any any interest in the horses guys I didn't, know, I Christmas? didn't understand a word you just said yeah. <laughs> I and that's exactly how you'll be looking at me for the next 40, 45 minutes but we're going to talk about Leinster's uh, clash against Connacht this evening and probably reflect on what has been an absolutely incredible year for Ireland and look ahead to the World Cup and also talk about uh, something I'm very interested in anyway uh, the French Federation may be talking about looking at how the tackle um, is going to possibly change in, in light of some horrific recent uh, deaths in rugby um, so there's plenty to talk about over the next 40-45 minutes um, but I guess we'll, we'll start with the game tonight um, Jenny this obviously it's it's going to be you know Leinster I think Leinster are 17 point favourites or that but Connacht's and I think traditionally Big Mal would know this. Connacht really like to raise their game when they're taking on Leinster. What can we expect? Like, yeah, we, you always, when you're playing against the, be the best, um, which Leinster are at the moment, you, you always want to raise your game. That's like part and parcel of it. So that's you know, the price of being a champion and that's what makes you better as well. And you, you, want, to, you want to get a scalp. And so that's what Connacht are looking for. You know, they Is it realistic? Um, like Connacht haven't won in the RDS in 16 years it's it's going to be a tough ask but the the line out for Leinster tonight they've they've got some new fra faces you know their ro squad rotation um, but yeah I, I think it's going to be it's going to be tough coming coming to Dublin and trying to get a win but you know they're, they're capable of doing it and like a great win um, a couple of weeks ago in Perpignan against probably not the strongest um, French side but like they're, they're a solid team they can definitely do damage just to see what comes out on the day I think you were you were on here with Andy Friend recently were you? I was yeah yeah um, what has he what difference has he made I know um, I'm, I'm from Galway myself and I know he, he I suppose he inherited a situation that had probably unravelled a bit but he's freshened it up and he just seems to be kind of um, I guess a motivator as well as a player someone that the players obviously are buying into yeah, like myself and Malcolm were, were talking earlier outside um, and the players just seem to to like want to play for him as well. It, like, you know, or John, sorry, Johnny as well. And, um, you know, when you want to play for your coach and there's a solid atmosphere in camp as well, it just makes it a lot easier. You, you want to do the work and when it's fun and you're looking forward to going training, I definitely to, do think that makes a huge difference. So I think that's kind of what he brought has brought so far. But that's from an outsider view anyway. It's probably better off asking some of the Connacht lads that. Yeah, like it's it's um it's amazing how Connacht Ruby has taken off. But like if you look at the the strength of as obviously Connacht are miles behind Leinster, but um, Leinster couldn't go into the game tonight expecting that you know this is going to be a cakewalk. Well, I wouldn't say that Connacht are miles behind by any means. They've got some fantastic players and um, they've got some more in the recent weeks as well like Tom Farrell is playing fantastic rugby you've got the likes of Tom Daly who's coming over from Leinster and you know he's again like a really solid centre and looking forward to seeing him playing out west so I don't think this is going to be like this is going to be a tough game for, for both squads so like Connacht can get the win it'll be tough but it's it's definitely not unachievable just to clarify what's your situation at the moment um, I'm currently injured I can see the light at the end of the tunnel um, so I'm hoping to be back playing rugby in 2019 haven't got a date yet but the gym sessions are getting mankier I'm hating my <laughs> physio more so that means that yeah it's it's getting close 
Just you've, get an oval ball in my hands. Yeah, because you've uh, I, I, there's a lot of new players in the squad that's just been announced. Yeah, um, Adam Griggs, the the head coach now, he's he's blooding a lot of players and and giving uh, girls some opportunities coming into Six Nations. So it's. it's it's a good time for on rugby. Let's see how they go. It'll be a very tough game um, against England. Starting off, they've just signed um, a few. A few of the girls have gone uh, fully professional um, on the England side. So three or four of them, um, which is you know, that's, something that I'd must be, be pretty, a bit of a yeah, a bit of a break. Like that'll be yeah. ah yeah, that'll be. I'd be definitely be lying if I said I wasn't jealous about that. Like that's a huge step forward in women's rugby, and it's going to be it's tough here when you're fully amateur playing against semi-professionals and fully-fledged professionals. Well, com- coming from a League of Ireland, I suppose, background, like that's it's ten a penny that there is a mixture of semi-professional and professional, but how sustainable could that be in Ireland if the women's team was ever to go down that route? Um, it would be difficult. England have a lot more um, number, like a, a lot higher numbers playing, um, but, you know, it's at the, at the moment, I think we're, we're quite a bit behind, and if we want to stay within touching distance and get like silverware and trophies we we need to be kind of pushing on ahead instead of waiting a couple of years and then reacting and trying to play catch up so um i don't i don't, probably don't have the answer but i do think like we need to be you need to be training as much as you can and seeing with like when the men's team went professional years ago it definitely did change uh it did change rugby and um, like better brand of rugby in my opinion as well and at that the women's game is going to go down that way or the gap will will, will widen. widen how much did the world cup knock us back um signif- like significant amount home world cup and coming out of there there was so much hype about it as well tv coverage you know and ma- like wall to wall coverage really yeah it's just disappointing mm. um but again like you know you probably I'd like to think you learn more from from disappointments than you do from the losses so hopefully we as a team and the union will learn from that so that something like that doesn't happen again our next World Cup is, is going to be in New Zealand and you know I'd like to think that we're, we're going for a top four place and then it's all to play for from there but like we need to be starting that kind of journey now and thinking about how are we going to get there so like starts with the Six Nations and I think to be fair coach like Adam Griggs who's invested so much into women's rugby he's He'll definitely push forward in the right direction anyway. Big Mal, how are you keeping? Great, great. Yeah, um, Very interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It kind of, to me, that kind of, it smells a little bit of the way the, 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 the men's game went. Used like to be. It, went, yeah. it went. It went professional in England first, and it became very attractive for all uh, Irish players who were, who were sitting here, like, you know, playing amateur rugby. Like, suddenly they were getting attracted all over to England, and there were some nice, tasty contracts for players to play over in England. I obviously don't know if the, that if there's going to be a, a professional league in in for the women's game, but it's uh, you know it, it's a threat certainly to to the Irish w- women's game would be that you know suddenly players are going like well actually I can make a living over in England now. So. Like some of the cricketers who basically just uh, they've left yeah. left play. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Um, this game tomorrow night, I'd say the RDS will be buzzing as well. Just what have been uh, you know you're, you're coming into yeah, Christmas. Yeah, coming into the Christmas, especially this time in, in like in Dublin now, it's really buzzing. Yeah, um, like it's uh, full house. I try to get tickets for the Ulster match, uh, and they're also out. Uh, so, uh, you yeah, know, it's disappointing. You, you know, didn't hold the old, do you know who I am yeah. or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, well, well, well I you did know, the same I for next numbers, week. Yeah. And I text uh, yeah. the, P- the PRO and uh, Fiona hasn't replied yet. <laughs> <laughs> I text her on Tuesday and yeah. she still hasn't replied you're yet. Retired, so. <laughs> you're retired nearly 10 years, man. You're kind of, kind of more important people like than you. Anymore. Yeah, so. Yeah. I guess, uh, you know, Dublin just seems to be a rugby kind of city now more than it ever has been I, I've said this before if you if you want to watch a Premier League game on Saturdays you have no chance of getting a screen unless it's a big pub if, if Leinster or Munster are playing because the rugby's going to be on even Wales might be playing Australia and that'll be on yeah yeah for sure it's it's just it's gone a bit mad you know and and the hottest ticket in town is, is in the RDS uh, and Con- and, and Connacht it's, it's always a, it's always a challenging match for for Leinster because Connacht do do bring uh, you know bring an intensity there that fewer teams can 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 why is that to it. I, I don't know I think there's a, there's there's a good rivalry between the, the two groups um, is there an old kind of West looking certainly to in my day I think we we felt like sometimes you know when you're you're in a 
you're playing against Connacht, yeah, do you kind of assume you're going to win when you shouldn't really? And then, you know, Connacht just bring unbelievable fire uh, and energy and, and they're so determined to win, you know, and they really, it really means a lot for them to, to uh, beat Leinster. And they've beaten Leinster, uh, certainly in my tenure, they would, they would, you know, they would beat us uh, certainly in, uh, in the sports ground and, um, you know, uh, and it was, it wasn't an embarrassment, but it was, you know, you know, we didn't, Leicester weren't able to perform uh, and Connacht just would, would, would uh, just stop us from playing the way we wanted to play. Um, and uh, that's what Connacht will try and do, you know, if they've got a chance of winning, is that they've got to stop Leinster from doing what they like to do, which is, you know, play this kind of really fast tempo game. Uh, I think it's going to be very difficult for, for Connacht to do it. Um, I, just, I just think, they're ju- at the moment, Leinster are just absolutely flying, you know. But at the end of the day, if they get the top two inches, come out with real fire and knock them back on the gain line, um, they give themselves an opportunity. Yeah, I was going to say that, um, Johnny. What what do they need to do to have any realistic chance? I think that's really. I think the. I suppose the back row is something to try and stop that quick ball. I know it's kind of, you know, cliched, but the way Leinster are playing, if you can manage to slow their ball down at all, I think uh, you have a chance. But you know, I think the worrying thing for all the provinces in Ireland um, is that. You know, it's the rotation system that you know Leo's going to employ over the next three weeks, but it's the quality that he has on on his hands. You know, there's a a conveyor belt of of guys coming from 18 the whole way through to 22, 23, and you look at the the rotation that's gone on this week, and you know you're saying, oh well, Scott Vardy was rotated into the team. I, I know that was because of different injuries and stuff in Europe, but you're kind of like, oh, my God, not bad know, rotation, not bad rotation. Yeah. And you look at the side they've picked. You know, Dan Levy still plays. You know, Ross Burns, an international fly half. He comes in. He's really starting. You know, really improving. And the like, the two guys that for me who were probably not a question mark but when you look at the team that was played last week you go Rory Rockin at 12 and and Adam Byrne on the wing you're kind of going oh they might be tested but the two lads were incredible last week Mm. and that's just the power that that Leo has at at his disposal disposal. so I think it's going to be an interesting three weeks for for the other provinces but you know I I read this morning that it's uh, Leinster have lost one of the last nine um, Interpros, which is incredible, in. given that that aforementioned rotation. Yeah, and we, Mal and I were saying, and especially around the, the the new season structure, the way they've changed the the, the derbies that there, there's three in a row, so you actually have to rotate a huge amount. So you look at it, and it's clear, like this week, you know, it's clear that you know Munster are, are, are targeting probably next week, and Ulster are targeting, uh, you know, we're, we're targeting Friday night, and th- then when they're away, you know. So, but Leinster, you're kind of like, well, they've a rotation and they can probably pick three equal squads. Yeah, mm. you know, and that's the luxury that that Leo has at his disposal at the moment. Uh, just to mention, our, our Saturday panel is brought to you this afternoon in association with Leo Healthcare, which is the official official health and well being partner uh, to Leinster Rugby. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, the number eight for Leinster because um, this this guy is actually from Mayo um, originally, which means he probably should be playing for Connacht, but. Um, Everyone is. When I was doing a bit of prep for this show, uh, everyone from rugby I spoke to was like Caelan Doris. This oh. is the name. Mm. Caelan Doris and um, Max Deegan on the bench. They are both exceptional eights. Mm. Like mm. I'm like. And where do they fit in in terms of the eights for Leinster? So what are they like? Third and fourth, second and third. That's the, the thing. You're, you're kind of looking at them and you. you yeah. <sighs> As eights, they'd probably be two and three. Mm. How good is Doris going to be? Um, yeah, he's he's like he's obviously he's physically he's already there, you know. So how old is he? Twenty two, twenty three. Yeah, I think he played twenties last year. I think yeah, twenty one. Like so, physically he's actually already there. So you know, um, uh, he's a phenomenal player. He, he like he's a real grafter. Where, you, where Max Max Deegan, I, I would see him as a, a phenomenal athlete, uh, maybe a little bit looser. So. His uh, it probably suits him to come off the bench a bit, you know, when a looser when a game loosens up a bit, uh, if he's out in the out in the the, the wider channels, um, he is phenomenal. Um, you know, where where Kaelin is probably better in that tight that tighter space, finding those extra tough yards. 
you know. So they're actually really a, a nice combination. Uh, yeah, nice little uh, couple of lads to have in, in as backup, yeah. for sure. I guess as Leinster fans, well, it must be very exciting even to go to a game like this because you're looking at that that player who's just on the fringes, who's like could be making the breakthrough, and you're just you're getting access to so many different players week to week. You know, in that like, so if he's going to rotate again for the other two interprovincial games, you see like uh, how, how many amount of changes he's going to make, and you're like, it's actually engaging to see because they're pushing for a place in the team as well. Yeah, like you've got you've got the. I guess the Leinster Champions Cup size and then the Pro 14 and there is overlap but there's still two exceptional teams which you know a lot of a lot of other clubs don't have that luxury and um, so as as Leinster fans we're in a pretty good spot at the moment like no matter what kind of game or what um, competition you go see you know you're going to see some quality players and some really good rugby Jack Carty against Ross Byrne um, who's going to win that individual battle? Uh, personally I think Ross Byrne is he you know two years ago you were kind of thinking right okay he's going to have to really step up over the next you know year year and a half and I really think he's improved massively um, and he he can now stamp himself on a game which probably 18 months ago he probably couldn't his kicking is is very good uh, out of hand and off the deck has improved massively so um, I think he is trying to solidify himself as you know third choice 10 to really try and push to get in that World Cup squad Is, is he definitely the third choice 10 and would like, is there any chance that Carty could stake some sort of claim? Uh, yeah, well, you look at you look at Car- Carty and you look at JJ Hanrahan, um, you know, and you know probably the forgotten man Ian Madigan across over in Bristol. Um, Likes the horse as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's it is tight, but I think that if it was an out and out. Uh, showdown between four guys. It will probably be between Madigan and um, you know Anne Ross, and I think the one that's going to always get it is the home base player, mm. and and that probably that that just happens uh, the way the structure is here, and that's the way it is. But you know, I, I think Ross Byrne is developing into a really really fine player, and you know. Th- the next two and a half years that he's going to have under Johnny Sexton, you know, there's going to be a bit of an arm wrestle there, and it probably he was probably one of the only people in Leinster that was hoping when all the news broke mm. about Joey Carberry going. I actually That's hope he moves. Good. Yeah, he was the because it, it's created a massive opportunity, and we have to say, I know David Nusafora, his name is kind of muck up around Dublin, but he's 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 doing what's right for Ireland, and and it's you know case in point is is Ross Byrne, I think. Mm. How do we call the game so? Uh, I think I think their winning run is gonna gonna continue. I think there's gonna be uh, a lot of pressure applied by uh, by Connacht, and you know I think the Connacht chip on their shoulder will really be there to see tomorrow. Chip on their shoulder. Yeah, they Connacht do have that oh, though. You know, Mal has alluded sure. to that, and and that's something that 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 you know that they need. You know, they haven't won for however long, and you have to sometimes you go into games where you know you're part of a side. Oh, this is rotation, and this is this, and but you're like, well. Still a game of rugby. It's still a game of rugby, and I think that chip can t- can go a long way to winning a game. I think it might not might, might not do it tomorrow. I just think Leinster just have too much class in the likes of Dan Levy, Ross Byrne, Scott Vardy, who can probably just control a game. That axis can really, really control a game. So for me, I think it's going to be tight, but I think Leinster shade up by maybe five or six. You were I saying think. five or six. You were saying you miss playing in the sports ground as well. Yeah, well, I was, I was, yeah, I was saying like the only, the only, <laughs> the only chance that I, I, I would give Connacht it would be if they had a kind of like a Galway style wind blowing down <laughs> the RDS. You lads uh, living in Dublin, like you know, you know I, I live there wild. myself, but I'm from Galway. There's no difference whatsoever in climate. It's like two different continents, like. Oh, yeah. So when you go down yeah. to the sports ground, you have the dog track, yeah. and you have the wind, and you have and the, the chip on the shoulder, yeah. the and the hypothermia. Kind of oh. and hypothermia. <laughs> yeah. I can teach you how to catch a kickoff now on that wind. That's, <laughs> I've learned a lot over there. Yeah. How do we call the game? Uh, I think Leinster will win, and I think they will thump them a little bit. Yeah, I think uh, it's a seventy points. They will, points they will spread, point. Yeah. I Jenny? think they will put a few points on them. Yeah. 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 I'm thinking Leinster. Leinster by ten, tight for the first twenty minutes, and then, um, and then maybe Leinster will pull away. Like solid bench coming on as well. So, yeah. We'll move on to Ireland and uh, I suppose reflect on the year and look ahead to Joe Schmidt's last year in charge as well, coming out in the World Cup. Um, you mentioned Joey Carberry there. What year will he have, Mal, and what, what's the 
I suppose the the real upside for him. Well, I think it was uh, it was a, a great move uh, between New Sephora and to get them get him into Munster, and um, I think it was a real challenge for him because with JJ there and you know coming into coming into like a you know a squad with a lot of senior guys and he's you know a lot of expectation uh, and I think he has certainly delivered so far. Um, I think his his his. His one thing he needs to sharpen up on is obviously he's, he's kicking from the ground. Uh, there's always been a slight, you know, uh, worry for him. So I'm sure he will continue to work on it. Um, but that's something that he needs to he needs to really try and up his percentages on that. How much but of that, like how much of kicking from the ground, is utter utter natural innate ability, and how much can you actually you can progress just through practice, practice, practice. Yeah, I definitely. I, I don't know, Johnny. Think, no more. It, it, it's there is a natural ability needed, but there's a certain routine and um, balls. Process. Well, yeah, you, just, you, know, you know, there's a process that that you have to go through, and you know, every you know, y- y- there's a process. Different guys have different thought process, but you know, someone um, like Dusty Hare, who I would have worked with, or. Um, you know the guy Johnny uses. Uh, can't think of it. But they, the, the, uh, yeah, Alred. Dave Alred. Like they basically plant you so that you're kicking the same kick every single time. So if you get your regardless aim, of where you are, regardless of where you are, you get your aim correct. What if you're the playing the sports ground? Well, then you have to. It's your aim and your judgment of the wind, basically. Yeah. You know, and you'll see, guys. The reason that works is they actually approach the ball and from a different angle every time but in actual fact it's the same kick that if you're standing in front of the post so I do think I think Joe and Joey is is just kind of like a bit of a feel kicker mm. he kind of he kind of feel like if he was he, he, when he was maybe 12 or 13 he's probably almost as good as a kicker as he is now you mm. know kind of way he just kind of is like one of these guys that just could do it and just kick it or he could crossbar challenge he'd hit the bar you know mm. like it's just a real talent but just to really hone in to get that uh, absolute uh, accuracy that's needed at the highest level, that's the real challenge to him. Like his, his, there's no doubt his skill ar- around the park and his ability to, to find holes will only grow. And as the, as the Conor Murray uh, Carberry relationship grows, that's going to be uh, you know uh, a real challenge to any side that they play. But that, that's uh, kind of the I suppose the exciting thing for Munster is just that that's so much in its infancy with Murray having come back so recently that yeah. when they click, um, you know how much yeah. of a dynamism could be yeah. there. But yeah, that, that and then all the other players, mm. yeah. they have to work with them as well. They have to learn, you know... Uh, Collective understanding and all absolutely. that. Absolutely. Like, like the way uh, the... Uh, the uh, I was going to call him Rob. Uh, Lowe, the, wing, the, the Leinster winger Lowe scored with, uh, with Jemison Park. Mm. You know, he knew that he was going to get that, the hands free for that try. I don't know if you remember that try. Mm. Uh, and he got that ha- the hands free... He, James Gibson Park knew that was going to happen, you know. And if he didn't run that line uh, when when he did and just go for it, it would never have been a try. So it's 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 guys learning that and having that innate knowledge to know that Carby's going to do this. Uh, that will make it will, will make him look even better than he is. And I think with the you know with the partnership that is in Leinster, you know, with Luke McGrath, and Johnny, and you know, in Munster with Connor and uh, and Joey Carberry, I think that's something that you can go that if you go into a quarter final or a semi final, and one of our two best players is injured, you're going well. As Miles says, they play with each other week in, week out. Something like that might happen mm. just because they have that relationship, that relationship that they train with each other every single day, and that's that to me is one of Joe Smith's biggest strengths over the last four year cycle. That he looked at what happened in you know against Argentina or the week into Argentina losing those guys, and he said, "Right, this is not going to happen again." And they're actually in a place now that you know you you lose those guys, you know. Probably Devon Toner, probably someone after what you know in New Zealand and, and stuff that's someone that they probably can't afford to possibly lose. I don't know, man. You probably know more yeah. from a line out perspective. Yeah. But like outside of that, you know, you could lose one of and win a one off game. You know, might not win a semi final and a final without both of them. But I do think that the the squad that has been developed is close enough to being second to him. Who's our most indispensable player then? Is it still Sexton or is it like, well, we have a replacement for him? Is it Omani? Is I it actually a- don't think it is one mm. of Connor or, or Johnny. I think 
from an outsider looking at the functionality of the line out and from an attack coach perspective I think someone like Dev is possibly as it important. Depends who you're playing against though as well. If yeah. you're playing against New Zealand who've got two six foot sixers or England or even France you know because the line out can, is such an attacking weapon mm. uh, now so if you can't win your line out you're in big trouble and uh, you've got a six foot ten uh, uh, dude like he, he, who literally just needs to go up in the air and he's going to win the ball uh, like yourself in the day well he'd be like I used to train against him <laughs> like and we go shoulder to shoulder and he'd still catch the ball and it wouldn't be any hard like I'd be ready to catch but his arms are an extra couple of inches longer yeah. you know so he catches the ball in front of you um, and he's great hands a great ability uh, so yeah he is he is a handy man to have that's for sure um, I, I think I think for James Ryan he will be I would imagine Dev Toner's uh, stand in rather than Henderson yeah. uh, long term but I think at the moment they're using him uh, they're keeping him focused obviously and just doing what you're doing and don't worry about the line out and from running a line out how complicated is that like I used to watch the lads because I kind of always knew I'd be interested in coaching and mm. some of the stuff when we were in Munster like there was a, a, a nod at the playbook yeah, yeah yeah you know and even yeah. in Leicester when we were you know yeah. like the like lads Paul O'Connell would have a line out he, the one, he would do this one he was too, like he'd say right and we would everyone would have done so many line outs and he said he'd walk in and he say and they see the problem people do so much investigation into a line out so so he would go in and says now when I say this is the call is because he used to say the call is yeah. X Y Z P <laughs> and then we all stand there and throw the ball in so he says now when I say the call is throw the ball in and we go up in the air right, okay. so he yeah, just yeah, go yeah. the call is and go up and you get the you get the yeah. the jump on them and that's yeah. the key with the line out is just getting the jump on them yeah uh, so. Uh, we do all sorts of stupid things <laughs> like that, you know? But it and then you'd have the nod, the wink, yeah. you know, anything just yeah. as a trigger. Yeah. Just, just to get up in the air in front of your, front of your uh, opposition. Yeah. Jenny, what can we expect from the Six Nations? Um, I'd say pretty good Six Nations, if I'm honest. Like we're but it's not, it, the, it's a, is it a slight means to an end? No, I don't, like, no Six Nations. Like, Six Nations is important. It's one of the, it's, you know, part and parcel of, Irish sporting year it's not so you don't look past the Six Nations I know it's World Cup year but you you play you're like that's the competition now at hand reigning champions like I, I possibly in the back maybe some of their head but like I, I doubt it you're like I know it's such a cliche thing but you are first game is England and you know that is a big first game so I can't imagine too much thought would be on looking past that's for like Joe Schmidt but like in terms of players the, the players it's you know Christmas period club and then you know, the Six Nations is huge you, you never you always want to win a Six Nations medal like. I, I can imagine in the English camp as well um, there's a serious hunger to put us slightly off our perch at the moment yeah well I think right. you know the chat out, out of the, the English lads is that you know they felt that they've underperformed um, for whatever reason, whether it's you know no no one's saying whether it's down to Eddie Jones or or, or what, but is it down to Eddie Jones? I don't know. Just some of the stuff for me just seems kind of silly, you know, and especially from a media perspective, how he engages and what he says, and then you know he has strange picks, you know, someone like Alex Good not being in. Uh, you know, not being in a squad for, you know, whatever, 12 months or so when he's playing so well for Saracens, who possibly are the only ones in Europe that can, you know, can push Leinster to, you know, from a squad basis, but also on a performance basis. I don't understand that, but look, each to their own. But I, I, I do think that he possibly is close to losing control, but, you know, and I think a lot of the guys kind of got carried away with the home World Cup the last time you know there was ads from O2 of the lads walking around as giants and you know every time someone dreamt of winning a, mm. a, a, a World Cup they got bigger and bigger and bigger and it just kind of got com they got completely consumed by it so you know I, I think there are danger next year if they can get their their also attitude Wales? Wales are kind of just tipping along under and no one's the talking about it yeah, yeah. waiting in the down. long grass yeah, yeah. Um, how much pressure would be on Jones if they did a pretty poor Six Nations? Um, 
there is already a lot of pressure on him, uh, but they can't really do anything at this stage. It'd be crazy to do anything at this stage because he's uh, built such a massive team around them. Um, I think England are are a confidence team. They're they're a team that certainly in the days um, in the days gone past they relied. They relied on just being, you know, that arrogance or that kind of confidence and that, uh, and the ability that they're they're bigger and they're stronger than you. Um, but that's not really the case now anymore. I think you know physically they they're they're coming up against teams that can match them. Uh, and the problem that they have at the moment is they're just not playing that uh, that you know good enough rugby. And I think their back rowers are letting them down a little bit. In their inability to play rugby, um, but. They're still a really good side, a really strong side. Um, and, you know, a couple of tweaks here and there, one or two players to come in, maybe, you know, a centre to appear at somewhere. Um, you know, they, they, they will be there, thereabouts, because defensively they're really strong. Yeah. Like, there's not much, they don't give much away. Uh, and, like, you know, we look back at the Twickenham game and it was just, it was just unbelievable. And we... we now the problem is with Ireland is that expectation for, from our point of view to, we're expecting to move on from that like, but we probably have to take a step back or two and just uh, focus on game by game each and it, player. it really is game by game though yeah, each, player, each player is fighting for position yeah, there. and there's so much you of know, the media narrative of the World Cup know, but it's like and you look where England were this time last year like England were on the, on the crux of winning the Six Nations and now we're talking about Eddie Jones is for the, is mm, for for the, the chop like. yeah, for mm. the chop and you know a year like a year is a long time in rugby and we still a year to go to well nine months to go to to the world cup so they have a lot to do ireland still um and you know they've also got the opportunity to become number one in the world which would be phenomenal mm. uh and to do that they probably need to win a six nations uh i think uh england it's a good time to get england because eddie jones probably still doesn't know what is I think Mal hits the name when he says centre he doesn't know what a centre pairing is because he chops and changes between Farrell at 12 you know I know Manu's been injured um, Tio's, Tio's in and out yeah. um, you know so they really don't know he's played at daily at 13 you know he's played Slade who I think is an incredible player uh, for me he's the man yeah, to build yeah. our team around and you, you look at what possibly it it should be, which should be Farrell, Manu, and Slade, and possibly someone like Cipriani, and you know, on the bench to come on and maybe pull a few strings. But you look at that 10, 12, 13 axes, and you're going right. But he doesn't settle on a pairing, so he's got and nothing he to build have, on. There, yeah, you know? he doesn't have a framework. No, he just has all these really good individuals that can mm. do brilliant things. But it's like it's like, almost like the French problem. The French are the same situation where they've got really good individuals, yet that framework. Yeah, that framework just isn't in place. We're in it with Ireland. Like you pull anyone out, even Johnny Sexton out, mm. and you, you're putting in someone that knows exactly what to do and knows all the moves, knows all the plays, and that's the whole of bring, a Joe Schmidt team, I guess. Yeah, and can bring his own little something to it that brings his own challenge. Yet. Everybody seems to be still off the same hymn sheet. It's an incredible, incredible thing where Ireland are at the moment. I think it's more that Ireland just seem to be just keeping on going up, going up another gear. Yeah. Which where, is do, where do they go after he leaves, and where does Andy Farrell's sort of team come from? Um, nobody seems to really know the answer. No, no, we'll be stepping off the edge of a uh, of cliff into the abyss then, because we we, we just we don't we just don't know, yeah. you know, and uh, and I think it's. Is there any, any strange dynamic for you as a player if you're playing in the team at the moment? You're like, you know Andy Farrell is just waiting in the wings. You know yeah. Joe is kind of, whatever, Yeah, but it's a, it's a thing we've never as... Uh, it's quite unusual. As, we've never had this kind of... Succession. Yeah. Succession planning. Like, it's always been like, your man, get rid of him. Mm. We need a change. Get this fella in. Mm. You know, it's going to change everything. You know, but we're not looking to change anything. All we're looking to do Continuity. is just bring yeah. everything on. And we're not looking to take from... New Zealand or take from Australia where they've obviously got something better than we have we're saying we've got we know exactly what we want we've got the best players in the world we've got a really good coaching system we've got great structures and we want to harness everything and keep going forward where, where does Joe go down in Irish sport and history then? this is even before a World Cup bid oh, like in just in terms of rugby one of the best doesn't even need to be mm. um, on the island it can be like well, he's, he's one of the best 
rugby coaches ever. Like I was so lucky in in twenty fourteen before, um, for the women's World Cup, uh, he came in with Les Kiss to to take a session. What was that like? It was brilliant. It was so interesting. You're just kind of a sponge, and you could, you know, talk to him all day and learn so much. I was standing beside him while kind of a game was going on, and he. I, mean, I think he was like he was eight phases ahead of everybody else, and it wasn't you know there it wasn't like crazy complicated drills. It was like just simple things done really really well, and everyone like like Marcus said, everyone knowing you their job. In the dark, yeah. No, so and it was and his his passion for the game as well was was so evident, um, and then like that as a player, you buzz off that as well. Um, but like just huge learning experience both with himself and Les just like like first of all we loved coming in it was, it was the first ever um, men's Irish coach to come into the women's camp and take a session and it, yeah immediately was like oh like such a lovely thing to do and he clearly knew how like how much work we'd invested in it and so for us so grateful but like also just learning the small right in that like hour and a half he reminds me of Aidan O'Brien in the sense that it's, it's massive attention to detail and like deflection of kind of credit and it's all this humility in that like you know I'm just part of this process of a massive team around me and it's just never get ahead of yourselves and I think that's probably what I think it's a sense of accountability that he brought Andrew Conway tells a great story when, when he first came in and like he lost five on the trot for Leinster and then there was talk the Derby game was Munster Leinster in the Aviva the week before Heineken Cup. I played in it, and Leinster beat us. I think ten six. I think was the final um, was a final score. But there was talk like certain journalists were saying like he loses this game with six on the bounce. He might be like they might might be a quick exit for Joe Smith, and then <laughs> he just kind of went from there. And his record speaks for himself. But I think. Conway tells a great story that there was a meeting one day and it was after I think their fourth loss or something and they're coming in and he said right lads get your coffees because you're going to be in here for a long long while and they come into a meeting and first person he picks out uh, is Drico or you know he, he has a go at Drico from like what are, you, what, what, what are you doing here and everyone kind of stops and goes like, yeah. this is Brian like, yeah, no, yeah. You, know, you don't say this to and then not only did he go after him he went after like everyone in the room as if they were just like it was just that was it you you, you did something wrong you got called out and no way you, you go you can't imagine Mourinho and Pogba quite well no, no but I, I just think he has that and I remember Andrew Trim I've said this before I, I know Trimby quite well and I went up to, I was in camp one week and I went up it was the year uh, uh, Trimby got Six Nations Player of the Year nominated for it and I said Trimby how, how's the last you know six weeks gone and he goes it's been like the best six weeks but probably the most petrifying six weeks of my career mm. because like that you go in you're like uh oh I don't know if I'm good or bad or he just has that and that's the way he run he, he runs it and that that's you know, and I think he's brought that accountability to actually all like Irish rugby. Mm. You know, not just you know the people yeah. that he's worked with, but it's actually in Irish rugby now as a whole. Um, I just wanted to bring up uh, something that was uh, I think was mentioned yesterday initially. This is uh, the French Rugby Federation proposing cha cha changes to uh, the rules of rugby tackling, including lowering the legal height of a tackle to waist level. And this comes after the death of a uh, Stade Francais teenager ten ten days ago. Um, and there have been a couple of other deaths as well um, from uh, young rugby players. Um, we spoke about Johnny Sexton obviously earlier. Um, he's probably been the go-to guy when it talks to the tackle and the danger of the tackle. But um, how feasible or, or plausible um, is this as a proposal to, ta to tackle the tackle? Well, I think it's, um, and a lot of people said this before, it's, one way or the other, you know, at the moment we're kind of in this kind of hybrid where some weeks some guys get penalised, some weeks some don't and then the siding commissioner comes in and said, well actually that wasn't a red but it was a yellow, you know, the Farrell instance and, and all this kind of stuff where if they actually bring in a ruling and, and that's the ruling whether it's marks on your jersey or, or whatever it is, that that's just the law then you deal with it and you, you, you move on where at the moment there's a small bit of 
was that there's a bit of a grey area and it's kind of outcome based where it should be well he got up from that tackle so there was no malice there's no no one got hurt so away you go like where if it is if it is nipple line or if it is waist high then that's what it is I think waist high for me might be a bit much but at least it's clarity at least it's clarity you know what it then does is it creates possibly more of an offload game it also brings back in you know the likes of someone which is possibly lost in the game someone like Neil Back and these guys who if you get them to ground you can really go after the ball from a, you know an old school seven perspective it's just proper scrum, like proper like scrum yeah yeah, like yeah. Uh, you yeah. know kind of groundhog stuff mm. where you get in over the ball where it just there just needs to be a decision either way and really? that's my viewpoint on it really you know yeah I, I like like echoing um, Johnny it's from week to week it's that's high and then pretty much the same tackle, tackle that's grand um, so as players as well you want to you want to show the ref what he wants to see and, and when there is that like grey area it's hard but again like I, I, I personally think like for me, waist height below is probably a little bit too low. I think nipple height below is, is fine. And even like, yeah, something like a line across a jersey or something. But you, but you see as well, like, sometimes it's a low tackle, but the the ball carrier dips into it as well. So that's, you know, once you've committed to that tackle, it, you, you don't stop. You're not thinking about that anymore. You're like, ball, ball, ball. Mm. Like and you want to get your woman or or man, mm. um, so it's it's hard when they shell up. Like that's a few times it happened with uh, Luke McGrath um, was was carrying the ball and again he dipped into it. So yeah, I think it's happened in the Premiership a couple of times with Will yeah. Spencer yeah. from Leicester and he got a red card. But you know the Wasp player it was very clear dipped in to brace for contact. Will's very tall, kind of six foot seven, six foot eight. So he actually sunk, but your man sunk below him, and it's it, it's, yeah. it's Malcolm. It's tough I, I, we're running out of yeah. time. Actually, yeah. but I'm going to have to just very quickly ask as well for your yeah. main hope for 2019. But very briefly, um, um, well, I, I think the problem with rugby it's a collision sport, and yeah. and now more and more it's all about the gain line, and so people are are being told that they need to make these offensive tackles. Uh, like when when I first started. We would tackle and we would tackle low. We want to get the person to the ground. That was the key. And then suddenly it got higher and higher and higher because we wanted to tag the ball and all that kind of stuff. So as long as the game is a collision game and it's, it's about the gain line, then you're going to get offensive tackles and you're going to have guys you know, get, have, getting concussed, getting hurt. Uh, I don't think the way, like, it's, you can make, get juveniles tackling low, learn, you know, that's the way it should be. They should, they should stick to, to tackling low. I think what happens then, they're going to the senior game and they're going to be they're going to have to learn then to make these high tackles and they're going to get hurt just the same. Like, you know, do you stop maybe teenagers playing at senior level? Like, nowadays it seems to be kids are so young playing at, at the top level. You question maybe the jump is maybe too, too quick and too high. Um, like, I don't know, you, you break down each, each one of those, uh, you know, the, the, the deaths, you know, like, and, and look... It might be individual, You know, look at wh why, why did this happen? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, you can't just blanket and say, oh, it's because they're ever tackling too high. You know, like, why, why did this happen? And, and investigate and try and learn from the death of these poor people. Sure, you know? and it is an, an absolute tragedy that this uh, might happen. Um, we, 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 we have to wrap up, but uh, in two words... And I'll ask you uh, individually, how confident are you about Ireland's World Cup prospects? Uh, I'd be confident. Two words. <laughs> I'll go one. Confident. Not very, confident. but confident. Uh, very excited. Very excited. Slightly ambiguous. Pretty confident. Pretty confident. I'm actually with, I think Jenny's answer was the most most accurate anyway. Big Mal, kind of, that one, that one could be interpreted anyway, really. Yeah. We're all excited. Take what you want out of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, this uh, Saturday panel was brought to you this afternoon associated with Leia Healthcare, the official health and well-being partner to Leinster Rugby. Thanks a million for coming in, guys. Have a great Christmas. Great. Cheers, Thanks. so much. Thanks. Um, after the break, we'll be looking ahead to this afternoon's Premier League action with Gary Breen.